Hi friends, this is Janelle Orsi of Sustainable Economies Law Center. I'm going to give you a quick tour of a legal document. We've been putting out several sample legal documents lately as part of a larger project called Seeds of Land Return. So I'll link to that resource and these are all legal tools that can help people liberate land from the exploitative market and return it to communities of loving stewards, which may include returning land to indigenous stewardship or to other groups who really want to just get outside of the framework of private property ownership and exploitation and restore a sense of kinship to land. And um, so yeah, this is a legal document that's in the family of conservation easements, which are things that are recognized under the law, under tax law, under state law. And so this is kind of a subcategory of conservation easements. And most often you're going to find easements like this referred to as cultural easements because they're not simply about uh, preserving land in its natural state, as many conservation easements are, but they're about actively um, cultivating or restoring humans' relationship with land often for the purpose of um, tending natural ecosystems, but also for the purpose of restoring uh, ceremonial use and access. And, and more broadly, I have at some point called one version of this document a kinship conservation easement um, because it's about restoring our sense of kinship with land. And I'm going to just walk through it and also share well, let's see. I'll just start walking through it. Okay, for one thing, it's full of cartoons and it's a slideshow, but it is intended to be a legally enforceable document. This is the kind of document, uh, an easement, is the kind of thing you would record in county records, so it's not the typical kind of thing you record in county records, but it is intended to be a legally enforceable document, and one reason I created it like this is it is about um, creating just a very different culture around how we relate to land. So using different forms of legal documents can help uh, embody that culture and get us into different mindsets when it comes to land and so-called real estate. And um, yeah, what else to say about that? I don't know. Okay, so here's a slide and I should say below most of the slides is more information. Links, sometimes there's other sample language, there's uh, information about the law. And I created this slide about where this easement came from because I created a draft of it maybe like a year and a half ago, kind of as an experiment after learning a lot about cultural easements. And cultural easements have mostly been used by tribes and other indigenous organizations to restore access to and stewardship of land by indigenous groups. In California, uh, these four tribes listed here uh, have all used cultural easements. And we actually asked a Stanford Law student named Joseph Ingrau to write a paper on cultural easements and create a sample cultural easement that could be like a model document. So he wrote this great paper. It's linked to from the slideshow. And this really gives a lot of background on uh, the law of easements in particular. And this model document, as you'll see, it's, it's 25 pages long. It's got a lot of the usual language that you'll find in a legal document, plus it's also annotated with footnotes. So it's a really, it's a helpful resource, even though my inclination is to not create cultural easements using long, wordy legal documents. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the, the longer the document, the longer it's going to take to do the transaction and more lawyers are going to have to be involved. But still, this is a really helpful resource that I wanted to flag. And so Joseph talked to or gathered easements um, that these indigenous groups had created, especially the Amamutsan Land Trust and uh, Winnemuwintu Tribe, and put together that model easement. And then after learning from Joe's research, I put together this draft. But as you're going to see, it's, it's pretty unusual as legal documents go. And creating unusual legal documents is um, something we do, and especially that I do, with the hope that people will see that they can take all kinds of approaches. Like My encouragement is for anyone to take something like this and get creative with it, make it your own, tailor it to your own circumstances because not everything in here is going to resonate. I mean, at times it's just goofy. So, 
Um, and yeah, and then I wanted to say, then we started working with Sigourte Land Trust, the amazing, wonderful women-led, uh, indigenous women-led land trust in based in Oakland, California, and they're trying to rematriate land. And they're the ones who I really started hearing the word rematriation from. And I on the first slide, I put a link to them and how they use the word rematriation. Um, so that's why we ended up labeling this rematriation easement, because we were developing this in conversation with Sigourte Land Trust, and then we got some volunteer lawyers from the law firm Shoot Mahali and Weinberger, Sarah Lucy and Gabriel Ross, who read through this easement, did some additional research, and just helped us answer a lot of different questions. We had, we wanted to make sure this is going to adhere to the law, and um, so their guidance was really helpful in making sure this is a legally sound document. So continuing through, oh, you'll just, there's a little bit more language in here and probably scattered throughout um, that speaks to how much this document is not simply a legal document, but, but trying to disrupt the normal practices, patterns, cultures uh, around land. Um, and I put this in partially because it's a legal document, meaning at the end of the day, if it ever needs to be enforced, it's going to go to a court. And a court, we don't want the court to apply all the conventional um, logic and ways of thinking to this. We want it. We want the court to really see what this document is, um, and particularly the kinds of relationships we're trying to nurture uh, among people and land. Okay, that was a lot of preface. Let's get into the document. Uh, like many documents, we're going to list the parties, and I'm going to assume that let's, I'll probably just refer to the group or the land trust. Let's imagine it's a 501c3 land trust that's going to receive this easement, while the owner, uh, we'll just call them the owner, even though ownership is a made-up concept uh, created to steal land from the commons. But we won't use perfect language all the time. So the owner is basically going to continue to own the land while giving the land trust access. And I created a not really great looking fake map here. But the easement area, we'll just call it the land area, is the full property. Uh, we're going to talk about an area, the residential area where the owner lives. And then there's going to be an area that the land trust is going to have access to and stewardship of. We'll call that the stewardship area. So here is the official grant of the easement from the owner to the group or the land trust um, to preserve and protect the conservation purpose of the land. So let's talk about this concept of conservation values and purpose because like I said, this is a conservation easement. It's recognized under the law. Um, the importance of sticking to that legal framework uh, is a few things. So, things that are conservation easements run with the land, meaning when the owner passes away or sells the land, the easement is going to go, is going to stay on the land even when a new owner comes in. That's called running with the land. But not all agreements run with the land, uh, conservation easements, at least in California. I should say, I'm speaking from a California perspective. Conservation easements in California are recognized as covenants that run with the land. So you do need this easement to meet uh, the standards of a co conservation easement. And um, the other reasons it's important is for tax reasons. You can get both a property tax assessment reduction. You can get an income tax uh, deduction for donating an easement to a nonprofit. So all that said, this is a particularly important section because you want to talk about what is it that you are conserving. So you might actually make this section longer, be more descriptive, to just talk about what's on the land that is worth conserving. What, are, what, what is there of value? Uh, there's cultural value, natural resource, open space. You know, These are the conservation values, and then you can go into more uh, detail about what's actually there, soil, plants, creeks, etc. And then the purpose, the conservation purpose of the easement is to protect those values, to allow an organization to do restoration stewardship, it's engage in ceremonial, traditional, etc. activities. And 
let's see, the next slide is also an important one that relates to the conservation values and purpose, which is basically, okay, actually I pasted some um, explanation of the law below this slide, which is under federal law. Um, and if somebody's granting an easement and doesn't actually care to get a property tax, oh, sorry, if they're granting an easement and they don't want to get an income tax deduction for the charitable gift, some of this is not going to matter so much. But we've tried to have this um, easement conform to federal definitions of conservation easement. And so the, the conservation purpose can be recreation, education for the public, uh, protection of natural habitat or ecosystems. But the problem is there's this concept of the ecosystem needing to be significant. Like, uh, don't get me started on how basically all of this is a effort to conserve white supremacy culture. But yeah, there's some, you know, weird standards as to what is considered significant, which may mean not all land will be considered significant. So, um, but then actually this easement is really, um, the one we're imagining, the kind of scenario that I imagine in my head here is um, about preservation of open space. It's about giving the land trust access to somebody's, basically their gigantic backyard. And there's, there may or may not be what is considered to be significant uh, species. There may not be also what's uh, called uh, historically important things. I mean, this is another um, element of the white supremacy is um, most historically significant indigenous sites aren't going to be aren't going to meet the criteria here because there's very little um, left to prove like what happened there who was there so that's sad so actually preservation of open space if you want to give a group access to a big backyard it needs to either be pursuant to a clearly delineated government conservation policy or for the public scenic enjoyment. So if the public is not going to visit or view this land area, which they may not because it's a big backyard, then what conservation, government conservation policy does it advance? So there, there's a little bit of stretching here into, or maybe stretching is not the word, uh, confining and sort of crushing ourselves into the box that is this federal concept of conservation purposes. Okay, I'm rambling, but long story short, Advancing public policy uh, is one of the one of the values that this conservation easement serves, and we are imagining the city of Oakland, and so uh, put a lot of city of Oakland's policies around protection of open space. And fortunately, there's a lot in the general plan, and many cities are now being a lot more active about uh, stating the need to protect open space for a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons could be water percolation it could be um could be wildlife protection fire mitigation all this stuff so hopefully your easement if you're going to create a similar easement you can go look in your city or your state or even federal policy and try to find policies that uh, support what it is you're trying to protect or cultivate so all right this uh, continuing through the legal document there's some more space for adding background like the more background you add the more a court or any other party is going to be supported in understanding the purpose intent of this easement um, there's a space for the owner to say more about what inspired them about the uh, a space for the land trust to say what um, what brings them to this relationship and then yeah, then let's get into some of the nitty gritty. Conservation easements generally include something called baseline documentation, which says, here's what's on the land now. Uh, you might do a more thorough job of this rather than just using a slide to list the plants. Uh, you could draw a map. You could have a botanist come through. I don't know, that might all be overkill. You may not need such thorough baseline documentation, but Sometimes this is a fairly extensive document that's attached. Um, and I guess it all depends on the conservation purpose, how much you need to go into here. Uh, I thought you could also do it by video um, to just sort of walk through and retain a video of what's on the land that you're wanting to protect. So 
baseline. Um, next is, uh, this section is establishing what the land trust can go and do on the land, access it to protect the conservation values, to, um, to tend to the animals and plants and the creek, and um, also host educational cultural ceremonial activities on the land. Uh, I was at some point experimenting with adding a right for the, the trust to build a small uh, dwelling. In some places that may actually make sense, like the, the whole idea here is that human presence and engagement is essential to conservation. And so in some cases having a dwelling may not, um, may not go against the conservation purposes, but that would also be unusual. And by the way, here's an example of another slide that has some sam it has some sample legal language under it because you might want to have a more extensive list of what rights are granted to the trust. Um, there's also other activities that the trust can do if they give notice in advance to the owner, like large gatherings uh, or maybe activities that'll involve noise or dust, uh, or a or a day when they want completely exclusive use of the area, meaning the owner uh, can't be going in the stewardship area. So that requires advance notice. Now you can tinker with all these things based on your particular arrangement. Um, and then there's also maybe things that the group can do uh, after getting the owner's consent and that the owner shouldn't unreasonably withhold that consent. Um, but you know, making improvements like a building a bridge or installing benches, inviting members of the public. Yeah, and then similarly there's uh, a slide about what the owner can do, and the owner generally can do most things that an owner can do as long as it doesn't disrupt the conservation purposes, and it clarifies, yeah, that the owner can still be in the space, invite guests and pets to roam free freely in the land area, the stewardship area, and um, that there would be certain things that the owner would need the trust approval for if they're going to do it. And then some of the owner's responsibilities, like being relatively informed about who is this group and um, what are their values and um, keeping the area free of hazards and so on. Now there's two slides here on prohibited activities. One is for the entire land area, meaning the whole property, and the other is just in the stewardship area. So excluding that residential piece. And if you're trying to get, particularly if you're trying to get property tax reduction, if um, let's say the property taxes are like 30,000 a year and you want the assessor to reduce it, they would do so on the basis that you can't further develop the land or extract profits from it. And so if you prohibit your ability to do that, uh, that could reduce the property taxes. and you might want to include a long list of prohibited things. I, I have a fairly short list, but here's some sample language below on prohibited activities. And all right, then there's some just sort of logistical stuff, the, how the parties are going to keep each other informed and give notice to each other, whether there'll be signage, uh, communicating uh, about and correcting problems, actually. So this is where the, I guess, the teeth of the easements start to appear, which is that if there's problems, uh, you have to notify each other and work to correct them within a period of time. If there's some immediate threat, um, like a bulldozer's about to show up, and there's not time to give people 120 days to correct the problem, um, there's uh, action. You can go to court and seek an injunction to enforce the easement, but preferably there's a strong preference here for talking and making a good faith effort to sort things out. And in fact, there's even a slide that says, let's try to avoid using our court system. It doesn't say altogether that we're going to avoid the court system, but to try because it's an easement of unique nature and, um, and it is in f the court system is in fact the legal system that perpetuated the theft of land from indigenous people. So there's a slide on encouraging people to talk things through or even do a mediation. And when 
and especially if the mediation doesn't work out and if a problem hasn't been corrected within the 120 day period or if it's really urgent like in this case yeah you can go to court and you can ask the court to use injunctions or restraining or orders or payment of damages or other things that whatever the court deems appropriate to carrying out the purpose of this easement and let's say there's a really significant violation um, and I actually didn't really have many significant violations I thought of to list here but like let's say the owner goes and destroys half of the plants in the stewardship area that's pretty significant uh, selling the property without giving the the uh, trust notice first could be a significant violation uh, because you'll see right here on the next slide that there's a right for the land trust to purchase if the if the owner ever sold so um, hmm. and there's a price it could be based on an assessed value a predetermined price etc uh, but basically, if the, on if the owner's ever going to sell, they have to give notice and a timeline here for the trust to get money together and purchase it. And um, in this case, if there is a significant violation, exercising that right to purchase is a way to um, enforce the easement. And by the way, I also included... So this piece is not that unusual. Uh, it's not that unusual to include in an easement. This next one is but it would be nice if we can make it a lot more usual, which is just to put a prohibition on unaffordable sale of the property. We know that, well, especially here in Oakland, um, the highest bidders are coming in and outbidding most people who have historically lived here in the East Bay and Oakland, and um, land is getting increasingly unaffordable. Uh, it's being grabbed up by wealthy people. So this just puts a cap on the price that the owner can sell it for, whether they're selling it to a third party or to the trust. Um, so, oh yeah, by the way, we created a whole other easement just specifically to do that. So in the Seeds of Land Return toolkit that I mentioned earlier, which links to the rematriation easement, it also links to a document we call a housing justice easement, which is very specifically about preserving the affordability of land and housing. Mm. There's also an optional right to lease. So let's say the owner's not going to sell it, but they want to lease out the house to somebody. It'd be great if the trust could lease it to somebody that works with them or that would be there and able to actively steward the land. So I didn't actually include that, but you could. There's some language here about the permanent, the intention for this to be permanent and run with the land, as in pass to the next owner. Uh, also, like let's say the land trust dissolves and many organizations do come and go, that there could be uh, in advance already determined that, um, that a different land trust or a different organization can receive this easement as long as they're you know, set up to do so and they have capacity and then it says, you know, if there's not another organization already designated that a court could assign the easement to an organization that fits the description. Uh, there's a slide about uh, either preventing or giving notices if there's going to be a encumbrance on the property, which could put it at risk of foreclosure, for example, uh, or maybe putting a cap on how much. Um, like the size of the debt that could be um, that the land could be securing a slide on tax considerations which is really just to clarify is the owner seeking a reduced property tax assessment or a charitable deduction because if they're not there's a lot more flexibility in how this easement is crafted it still needs to meet state law definition of conservation easements so that it will run with the land but may not need to go um, overboard in, say, prohibiting uses for the, the purpose of getting a property tax reduction or, um, yeah, it just gives a lot more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, okay, slide on easement protectors. This one is optional, but the idea is that if the land is being neglected or it's being harmed, and if the trust doesn't have the capacity or the resources to enforce this easement, that there could be other people in the community 
who are granted such rights. Could be other organizations, I think other individuals uh, call them the easement protectors. So they'll be keeping an eye out, um, sort of watching over this land and making sure this easement is carried out. Um, there's a short slide on how this easement can be amended, but it really does need to be um, in alignment with the conservation purposes. So you can't just make any change. Um, it could also be terminated, but only by a court, because uh, that would be a significant deviation from the intention to have it be permanent. Uh, there's just some other administrative stuff here, including acknowledgement that um, there may be other agreements that happen alongside this easement. So there could be a, an agreement for a period of a few years that says, you can use the water from this water meter, or you can host larger events. Um, without needing to actually commit to all of that in a permanent easement. Lastly, there's just some language to encourage um, everyone to read this document and really get into a mindset that um, this is an entirely different relationship with land. This is not viewing land as a thing and a thing that can be owned and broke, you know, a bundle of rights that can be handed out. I mean, it is. We are operating within our general legal system, but we are really trying to restore a deep sense of kinship to land or or other anyways at least I was when I was writing this document and and I said if um, you know exhibit a includes practices and contem contemplations to help you enter a mindset that will support your interpretation of this easement so after the signature page with a very official looking feather there is exhibit a now this is a very unusual thing to include in a legal document extremely unusual but I see no reason why you can't and if if we you know the our legal system basically assumes that if you take a document to a court or any issue to a court that people are going to um, decide it as a quote-unquote reasonable man or to update the language a reasonable person would but this is about saying no it's not just our reasoning conceptual mind here that's trying to figure stuff out this is like we're using our whole humanity to understand this relationship with land. And so I include a few just contemplative practices that people can do to get into the right mindset. Like, remember that we all did begin our lives as an inseparable part of a larger organism, but that after we were born, we continued to be that. Like, we are an inseparable part of the organism that is the planet Earth and the ecosystems that we live in and that feed us and provide us air and water. And so it's good to take time and um, contemplate this because we've been so conditioned to view ourselves as separate selves. And our whole legal system treats each human as a self and land as a thing that can be separated out and sold. Uh, so these things help get into the mindset, contemplating where your food came from and who was involved in creating it and seeing yourself as part of a massive web of relationships that feed you. Um, contemplating your affection for place or other, other things and imagining how you would feel if that were taken away from you and, and just, I guess it's, it's meant to bring empathy to, um, to what's happened to so many people in losing their relationship with land, losing the ability to affectionately steward land, and um, helping to see how important it is that an easement like this be upheld to, um, to basically ease, ease the violence of private property and hopefully create relationships. I, I mean, I hope we start plastering the world with easements and create relationships that um, get people actively, affectionately caring for land everywhere, particularly indigenous people who hold the knowledge, the deep, deep knowledge of uh, how we can do that. All right, thank you.